Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here uh, at this meeting, my first time uh, with this group, so uh, very interesting. Um, I'm presenting uh, material on behalf of uh, a doctoral student of mine, uh, Renzo Calderon. Uh, so this is uh, his work under my supervision and also with the collaboration of Felisa Naul, um, a, a Mexican epidemiologist at, at the University of Miami. Uh, so uh, COVID-19 obviously had a, a big impact on populations, uh, disastrous consequences for a lot of segments of society and uh, potentially consequences for violence against, violence against women and children. Um, a lockdown, uh, as occurred in many countries, presents opportunities for disruption and normal patterns of behavior and movement and surveillance and things like that. So uh, should be studied to see what its impact is and also impact on services provided to people. Uh, several countries uh, had helplines uh, where you could call in for services, which allowed some contact with agencies during the pandemic disruptions. Peru in particular uh, had a very difficult pandemic. Uh, they may have had the highest excess mortality of any country in the world or among the very highest in, of any country in the world. And they had a very early and very severe lockdown as well. So in terms of uh, movement and disruption, they, they had um, one of the most extreme experiences in Latin America and, and maybe even in the world. Uh, and this can give us some insights into how this kind of uh, tremendous disruption to schooling and to work and to movement and access to services can impact things like family violence. Uh, we took this data from the Peruvian Ministry of Women portal, uh, an administrative database, and uh, we used uh, data from this helpline that uh, has been active in Peru since 2006. It's the Linea Cien. Uh, people can call from anywhere in the country and uh, receive services in relation to family violence. Um, uh, they get emotional support and uh, referrals uh, for any kind of gender-based violence. Uh, there are trained operators who take the data from the people who are calling and then make referrals. They can be referred to a psychologist, to a social worker, to a lawyer. Um, so they're, depending on the call and the situation, um, they collect this data and they make whatever referral they're, they're trained to make under those circumstances. And they gather data like the gender, age, and relationship to the perpetrator. So we can analyze that data from the data set. We studied uh, children of both sexes under the age of 15, um, both sexes and teenagers from 15 to 18 years, and then for uh, 18 and above, uh, just women. And we studied uh, calls to this hotline in relation to the perpetrator's relationship to the survivor, where these were categorized as the perpetrator being a partner, an ex-partner, uh, a parent or step-parent, other relatives, or other people outside the family, things like teachers, coworkers, other fam non-family members. The type of violence, likewise, was categorized into several different categories. Sexual violence, physical violence, or psychological violence were the ones that we analyzed here. Uh, the caller, of course, could have a complex experience that involved some combination of these, but the, uh, the operator was trained to report uh, the, the most salient or the most important type of violence. So each record was categorized with just one of these categories. Uh, the lockdown occurred on March 16th, pretty early in the pandemic, and so we have a pre-lockdown period uh, for the year between uh, January 1st and March 16th and a post-lockdown period till the end of the year. Uh, and during this uh, lockdown, you had complete suspension of economic and academic activities, restrictions on gatherings, uh, people not permitted to leave their home except to seek medical attention, uh, curfew at night that was uh, maintained by the police and by the military, and closure of international borders, restriction of uh, travel between regions, things like that. Um, and we're able to make use of the previous year uh, in order to set up a kind of a difference in differences analysis where we can consider the difference between the early months in 2020, like January to March 16th, compared to the later months. Uh, but of course, there can be seasonal differences in violence or reported violence. And so we compare to the same difference uh, between the early months and the later months in 2019. So uh, from 2019 to 2020, there can be a secular change as you have more or less reporting. Um, but, and from the early part of the year to the later part of the year, you can have a, a seasonal change, 
but the difference between those two differences should represent the impact of the pandemic itself. We then further adjusted for uh, regional fixed effects and cluster the standard errors. And the primary outcome of interest here was the number of calls per population. And we evaluated the assumptions of that difference in difference model uh, with parallel trends, tests, and so forth. Um, we, we use the uh, modern formulation. I don't know if you know, difference in difference has been around for decades, but just in the last three or four years, it's been kind of revolutionized by the realization that there was a homogeneity assumption in the diffs and diffs model. In the, in the traditional two-way fixed effects approach to difference and differences, uh, there was an assumption that it didn't really matter when a unit flipped over to become exposed, um, that it was a homogeneous effect across time. And to allow for that to be different across the pandemic, we use these new estimators. There's a couple of different uh, approaches that have just been developed in the last few years. We use the one by Callaway and Santana. It basically set, uh, sets up a whole bunch of uh, different two by two tables to split time and allows us to do an event study where we can see what the impact is um, at, at each point in time. And I'll show you pictures of those event studies as well. So uh, this is what the data look like. So um, physical violence was the most commonly reported violence type. About half of the calls were about physical violence and psychological violence also common. Sexual violence, uh, fortunately, was only about 10% of the calls. Um, uh, adult women constituted half of the, all the calls and uh, children collectively, male and female children, about 40% of all the calls. So relatively few calls from adolescents. Uh, and then in terms of the perpetrator of the violence, uh, about a third of the time it was a parent, 20%, uh, 25% of the time a partner, um, another 10% for the ex-partner, and uh, about 20% of the time missing. So we had to do some additional sensitivity analyses around the impact of the missing perpetrator. Um, so here's an example of uh, some of the kind of results. So to orient you here, the, uh, I guess I don't have a pointer. Uh, See this pointer? No. Um, well, um, the three columns here represent psychological violence, physical violence, and sexual violence. And then the rows represent um, adult females on the top row. Oh, someone's going to give me a pointer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, here I have psychological violence, physical violence, and sexual violence. And then these rows are adult women here, um, adolescent females. Uh, here, and then children, female and male children, uh, in this row. Uh, and then I have the relationship to the perpetrator here, so the parent, the partner, ex-partner, so forth. Uh, and these are the average effects over the entire follow-up period. So, you know, there's some variation over time in the impact, and that makes sense uh, because the the restrictions waned over time. So at the moment of the uh, of the lockdown, mobility was completely disrupted, but gradually there was a loosening of the lockdown. So you can see some of these effects diminishing over time, but this just shows you the average effect over the follow-up time. So uh, to highlight some of these patterns, you can see that um, for adult women, there was an increase in reports of psychological violence, mostly from partners and ex-partners. Um, and a notable increase in physical violence from partners. So you can imagine that some of this has to do with people being locked together at home and being exposed to a partner without interruption or the intervention of other people. So you can easily imagine how that kind of a pattern could emerge for adult women. But then uh, for younger people, you see an opposite pattern. So uh, for adolescents, you see a reduction in uh, reports of violence from people outside the home, which makes a lot of sense because you're not exposed when you're in this lockdown to people outside the home. And similarly for smaller children, uh, a reduction in calls. So uh, for uh, uh, youngest children here under the age of 15, you see a, a big reduction in calls associated with abuse from parents uh, and also from others outside the family. Um, and as we'll talk about this, uh, you know, this is a complex interpretation because this is about calls made to the hotline, which can represent changes in the incidence of the events, but also can represent changes in the incidence of reporting. And as I'll discuss a little bit more later, 
Uh, for small children, a lot of the reporting comes from people at school, for example, and if kids are not going to school, then that reporting doesn't happen. So um, that, that can explain some of the effect. You can also interpret some of the effect uh, being, you know, if, if, a, if one of the parents is abusive, but the other parent is always present, then that may also prevent some of the abuse from occurring. Um, this is an example of the event study representation that I mentioned, where you can see how this effect changes over time in the follow-up. And uh, you can see, especially for adults, as movement is restored, uh, the lockdown starts to diminish in intensity over time, you can see that some of these initial effects of increased, um, uh, what is this? This, is, this whole panel is psychological violence. So these, for adult women here, um, these big increases in psychological violence that occurred from partners and ex-partners uh, start to reduce back to baseline uh, as the lockdown starts to ease over time. So that pattern is very clear for the adults. You don't see it so much for the protective effect of kids. So here you have uh, an immediate um, diminution in psychological violence for uh, children um, from people outside the home. And this remains uh, pretty constant throughout the entire follow-up. And uh, one thing that did not change throughout the entire follow-up is that school remained closed for the entire year, for the, all of 2020. So these kids did not go back to school. And so this could, the, the constancy of this effect could reflect that fact that f for them, the lockdown in, in the sense that they didn't go to school continued. Uh, here you see uh, physical violence. And uh, once again, for adults, you can see that uh, adult women, it uh, gets back to baseline over time. Um, so by the end of the year, you're pretty much back to baseline for adults and, and physical violence. Um, and for kids, again, it stays, uh, stays suppressed for pretty much the entire pandemic follow-up here. Uh, so you had those decreases that I showed you uh, for young children in reported uh, physical violence from parents and from people outside the home. Uh, and then for sexual violence, we had a much more modest effect. There were fewer calls, only 10% of the calls were for sexual violence and less of a profound effect on the reporting uh, of that outcome. But you do have this significant diminishment for uh, the youngest children here, uh, reduced reporting of sexual violence from parents and from people outside the household, and that remains pretty much constant throughout the entire follow-up. So uh, the overall interpretation is very different dynamics here in terms of the number of calls with respect to um, the gender of the survivor, the age relationship uh, to the perpetrator, the age of the person, the relationship to the perpetrator, and the phase of the pandemic in terms of uh, when restrictions were eased. Um, the most substantial increase was the calls uh, for psychological violence in adult women, uh, which, you know, has to do, I guess, uh, I think the easiest interpretation is that the home became a less safe environment when uh, abusive couples are locked together, um, creates a kind of psychological stress for the couple in, in relation to that, you know, being imprisoned together during the lockdown. Um, but there was also this decrease in calls uh, for sexual violence when the perpetrator was outside the household and a decrease in calls for sexual violence perpetrated by parents. And again, that's a, a complex thing to interpret because of the possible interruption and the normal mechanism by which that's reported uh, by schools and other people. Um, so I think I talked to these points already. Um, yeah. So... Um, Calls for sexual and physical violence against children perpetrated by parents decreased during the lockdown. This could be attributed to the closure of schools since teachers are often the ones that report the signs of violence. Uh, one US study found that child uh, maltreatment allegations uh, were lower by about a third in, uh, during the school closures during the pandemic. Um, in the US, teachers, lawyers, and health staff submitted more than two thirds of all reports of child abuse in 2019 while friends, neighbors, and others outside the household submitted 16% of the reports. So you can see that uh, if children are isolated at home with their parents, the normal reporting mechanism, the normal people who would call the hotline and report this uh, are, don't have access to the children to make those reports. Uh, and other studies from around the world in Brazil and New York City showed pandemic decreases in uh, reported violence against children. <clears throat> 
um, a lot of the uh, incidents of violence are not going to get reported uh, to the hotline. In any case, uh, some survey data that says that uh, for children who suffer sexual violence, 60% do not seek help, uh, and then the uh, small number sought help within the family, and only a smaller number sought help outside the family. So you would have an underreporting of events, uh, even under normal circumstances, and how the pandemic affected the reporting is uh, difficult to piece together from the, you know, the change, potential change in incidents and the potential change in reporting. Um, and this is also true of uh, physical and psychological violence, that a majority of uh, people are not seeking help, not reporting this, and then many who do seek help uh, do so within the family. So closure of schools and reduced mobility definitely would impact the normal mechanisms by which this kind of reporting would occur. Um, so then uh, overall we see increases in pandemic calls from women for psychological violence. Um, lockdown measures may have had a protective effect on violence from sources outside the home. Uh, unclear how changes in helpline calls correspond to actual incidents, as I said. Uh, the main limitation is this fact that we have two things that are potentially changed here. We have the incidence of violence and we have the reporting of violence. And since we don't know the relationship of those and we know that much of the violence goes unreported even under normal circumstances, it's very difficult to piece those together. Um, I should mention that another one of Renzo's papers for his thesis does try to uh, use sensitivity analysis techniques uh, to try to create bounds on the change in the events accounting for this underreporting. Um, but that's something that, you know, the sensitivity analysis has a range of unknown parameters. You look across this range and see what the impact is. You don't really know what those parameter values are. And it's for, I think, a big challenge in this field. Yeah, I'm relatively new to this field, but this is the major challenge, methodological challenge I see to this field is this tremendous uncertainty associated with the distinction between incidents and reporting. Um, and I'd like to see this literature you know, methodologically, I'd like to see this literature mature uh, to grapple with that uh, in some, uh, some way. I think that's where we can make a lot of advance. Um, one limitation is that we don't capture anything about the intensity of, of the incidents uh, from the data that we have. You know, the, uh, the person making the hotline call might describe aspects of the intensity of this violence in terms of duration and severity, and we don't capture that in the electronic record that we have. So we're not able to make distinctions between um, relatively more superficial versus more profound uh, instances of this kind of violence. Um, and we also lack information on multiple calls from the same survivor. So, you know, we have the total number of calls, but if a person calls several times during the pandemic, we have those as as independent uh, data points in the data set. We don't have any way of clustering that at the individual level because the confidentiality of each call is protected so that we don't have an identifier to indicate that it's the same person. So uh, just in conclusion, we, I think we get some insights here about the way that the pandemic affected um, domestic violence uh, in, uh, and violence against children in Peru, a place that had a particularly severe lockdown and a particularly severe pandemic. Uh, substantial increase in calls associated with psychological violence for women, decrease in calls for sexual violence and physical violence um, for children and women when the perpetrator was someone outside the home, which makes some sense. Um, physical violence against children perpetrated by parents also decreased during the lockdown, which may involve a different kind of mechanism for how that occurred. And we have this um, you know, this, uh, this doubt about interpretation about this fundamental distinction between these two things that can change in the pandemic and the inability to distinguish between those. Thank you. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Hi, thank you for your presentation. That was very interesting. Um, I was wondering a bit about the advertising of this helpline, especially for the children under the age of 15, how do they hear about this, this helpline and this number? Thank you. How, how do they know about the, mm -hmm. the existence of the helpline? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, you yeah. oh yeah, sorry. Um, as I indicated, in many cases, uh, if a, a 
child is the, is the survivor of the violence, they're not the ones who are making the call. It's often reported by a parent or someone in the household or normally someone in the school environment. And so um, it is possible that the calls are made by the survivor themselves, but especially in the case of children, it's less likely that the caller is actually the survivor. Um, we don't actually capture in the data set the identity of the caller. It's something that we wish we would be able to distinguish to answer your question quantitatively and say, well, in this percentage of cases, the caller was a teacher or the caller was a parent, um, but we don't actually have that field in the data set. But we know from other studies that uh, we discussed that in most cases for children of this age range, you know, up to the age of 15, uh, in, in other countries, uh, in other studies, that the person making the call is not the survivor themselves. Uh, so the, the existence of the, hot, uh, of the hotline is widely publicized within Peru, and so presumably adults have access to this information. Whether children know about the hotline themselves and are able to make the call themselves, I, I, I don't happen to know. Sorry, I just got a notice that the announced fire alarm will take place in five minutes' time. So as soon as it uh, sounds, we have to leave the auditorium and follow, I guess, this mister there. Um, I'm not sure. I think um, uh, one of the guides will show us uh, uh, one of the firemen who uh, takes uh, charge of the evacuation. Um, but, well, he said we have five minutes left <laughs> until the, the, the bell will ring. So I think there are still some couple of questions in the audience. Just, so just like the Titanic, we just go on till, <laughs> till the end. <laughs> I think I saw a question from you. Thanks very much. It is a really interesting talk. But I have to say that I think one of the most surprising things for me was the increase um, for the older women. Because one of the, the, the elements of this that is implicit in everything that you've said is that if you are in the house with somebody that you have no privacy to make these calls... And so I think that everything that's, you know, it, it's just that it really is like the Titanic, as Jesus was saying, it's the tip of the iceberg. And that for me is, is very scary, um, especially from the point of view of the children and the young people. Right. So th this is the idea of doing some kind of a sensitivity analysis to try to say, you know, under various assumptions about what percentage of calls get made and things like that, how bad could this situation be? But um, you, you could well imagine that the increase was greater than what we actually observed, but that many of those people were not free to make that call because they were stuck with their, with their victimizer. Yeah. Uh, uh, two questions. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, uh, so this is the data about uh, urban areas, and my question is if there is data about what's happening in rural areas. And the second one is uh, uh, if, if it is possible to make a relationship or an association with the uh, social climate in general in Peru, which is, uh, which is very, very hard all these years, and uh, if there is a way to, 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 to do an association between the context. Yeah, we, we do, we have, um, uh, we have province, uh, province? We, uh, I mean, we can, uh, we can divide the data by region and then uh, below region, I guess it's, uh, yeah, province. Um, uh, but even within a province, there may, be, um, there may be rural areas and urban areas within a province. So, I mean, there's some, you know, if it's in Loreto or something, we know it's, you know, very isolated. Um, if it's in Lima, of course, we know it's very urban. So there's some that are more homogeneous, but there's some where you might, not from the province itself, you might not know, but we can divide the data regionally or provincially in order to look at variations across the country. I didn't bring that analysis now, but we did go through that and look for important heterogeneity like that. And I, I don't think that there are any profound uh, patterns to report. Uh, we did have an overrepresentation of calls from urban areas where people might have had more awareness of this and more um, access to to the wherewithal to make the call, um, more educational level or, or, or other kinds of uh, resources that might have been helpful to make the call. Um, but in terms of the pattern of the impacts, uh, I don't believe that we saw any important regional variation. Um, so I was also going to ask you about 
uh, geocoded data or contextual characteristics, but you, you've answered that. But I wonder if you have um, additional data following the, the COVID pandemic and if you'd expect a rebound in the number of, of calls and notifications once, especially kids go back to school. Do you have any, any idea of that? Uh, yeah, actually. So we haven't, uh, we, we have the data through the end of 2020 and now the data do exist to the end of 2021. Um, so I don't know when people actually went back to school. I think it was in the middle of 2021. So a subsequent project, a very interesting project, would be to look at the potential rebound associated with the return of kids to school. So that, that's a great idea for future research. We have not done that yet. We didn't access any data beyond uh, December 31st, 2020 at this point. But the data are available and that could be done. That's a, it's a great suggestion. I mean, we already saw by the end of 2020, we already saw for the adults pretty much a return to baseline. Um, but we didn't see that yet for kids, and it would be interesting to, to pursue that and see what the pattern looks like for kids. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Jay. I just uh, got a message that we also need to take the computer, so I think, uh, <laughs> I think we're going to... Yeah, that's fine. Go down, but I think... Um, I've also took all the different questions from the audience for now. So thank you again very much for your intervention. Thank you.